Love Thy Neighbor is about learning about each other's culture. And so today I have a wonderful panel and we're going to focus on the Japanese ethnicity today. And so I would like to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. I'll probably just call on each of you so that um, you don't have to worry about talking over each other. And then we'll kind of go into the questions. So again, welcome and welcome to our panel. So how about we start with ladies first, Laura. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Laura. Um, I'm a third generation Japanese American born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I've worked for one of the California OPOs for about 10 years, almost now, um, doing organ allocation, assisted in the OR for about three, and I'm currently a clinical year uh, physician assistant student in Portland, Maine. Wonderful. And Laura, um, just for clarification for our audience, OPO is? Uh, organ procurement organization, so we help facilitate organ donation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, Dr. Hiroshi, how about we go with you next? Sure. Hi. My full name is Ryutaro Hirose, but everyone calls me Rio because nobody in America could pronounce Ryutaro, so I've got a nickname, Rio. Um, I was born in Kanazawa, Japan, on the West Coast, and I came to the United States when I was first about three years old and then went back for a year, but um, my parents moved me to the United States permanently at age five. So. Technically, even though I was born in Japan and I was fluent in Japanese up till age four or so, um, my vocabulary is about a four-year-old and my reading ability is about a three-year-old. So I'm completely illiterate uh, in Japanese, can't read many kanji. I can read katakana and, and hiragana, of course. But um, other than that, uh, with my name and my looks, I should, uh, when I go to Japan, they assume that I actually am a normal speaking, reading person, and I'm not. I'm much more American than I am Japanese. <laughs> but uh, I grew up in Boston area, in the Boston area in the Northeast. I went to college and medical school in New York at Columbia. And uh, about 32 years ago, I moved down to San Francisco. And that's where I trained in surgery and in transplant surgery and molecular medicine. And I've stayed on the faculty there. So I've been a surgeon here doing transplant surgery for over 20 years now. And um, so here I am in San Francisco and uh, I'm a professor in surgery of transplantation. So I perform liver, kidney and pancreas transplants. And you've had a very busy last week, I hear. Yeah, no, we did six liver transplants. That's amazing. Well, thank you for making the time to be part of our call today. Sure. All right, Juntaro, how about we go with you? So you're joining us live from, from Japan. Okay. So it's actually Saturday morning over there. Yes. Um, good morning, ohayou gozaimasu, or it, it, is it good evening in the United States in most parts? Um, I am Juntaro Ashikari. Haiti calls me Cool J. <laughs> and um, I... I was born in Japan. I moved to the United States, um, Chicago and Detroit when I was one years old to 11 years old. So I spent my childhood in the US. And um, after that came back to Japan, spent my um, middle school, high school and university in the Osaka area. And, and after graduating from um, postgraduate um, university, I became an organ procurement coordinator at the Japan Organ Transplant Network. And ever since um, I've been doing this job for 25 years. And that's when we met, um, Heidi and I met at, at a training course, was it? It was a training course in, where was in it? Arizona, I think, in Tempe, Arizona. Arizona. Yes, yes. Yeah. About Tempe, yes. 14 years ago, yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And ever since we've been friends, um, and um, currently I am the director of the um, organ information division, which is um, a division which um, allocates the organs in all Japan. So it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you. 
I love that we have such a mix of experiences uh, on the panel today um, because I think what's going to be very, what, one of my biggest concerns when we talk about cultural, you know, when we talk about different people's culture, it's so easy to put people into a box and say, okay, everybody from Japan and anybody who's Japanese believes this, but we always have to remember everybody has different life experiences. So even if you all have been raised in Japan, maybe there are more similarities, but that doesn't mean everybody fits in, in the box that we like to put people into. So that being said, um, uh, just talking about terminology. So Dr. Hiroshi and um, Laura, do you, um, would you identify as Japanese or do you identify as Japanese American? What's kind of the appropriate terminology? I definitely identify as Japanese American. Japanese American. I feel a lot more American than Japanese. But. <laughs> Especially if I'm in Japan, I'm a Japanese American <laughs> uh, because my primary language is English. I can barely speak Japanese well, I can order sushi in a restaurant, no problem, or ask for uh, whatever food I want in Japanese. But beyond that, uh, my Japanese proficiency is poor. So I would identify as Japanese American, mm -hmm. not Japanese. So, uh, and Laura, you, you kind of mentioned that you don't, um, earlier on when we were talking before we went live, um, can you kind of share a little bit what your experience has been so far and now moving to another part of the country. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's funny. Uh, in Japan, nobody even speaks to me in Japanese. They just speak to me in English because I, I look American. I don't carry myself like a Japanese person, I guess. But um, I, growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's a very diverse place. I didn't necessarily grow up with a lot of other Japanese people or Japanese Americans, but um, it was very diverse as compared to where I am now. And so I never used to think as much about being Japanese American. I always felt very American, but now that I'm in Maine, which is a very homogenous area of the US, uh, I feel very different. Um, yeah. And I feel, I feel that more than my Americanness, I guess. So you, you feel different because of most you're finding most of Maine is primarily Caucasian. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, so, it's the whitest state in the U.S. And I'm one of forty. I'm one of four minorities in my cohort of forty-seven, and that's pretty standard at this mm -hmm. particular university. Yeah. All right. Great. Is there terminology that people use to identify Japanese people that is considered offensive? I mean, you know, not purposefully being offensive, but that people might be using and not realize is considered offensive. Um, if you're not, uh, if you're half and half, we all often say hapa, um, or other terminology that may make you seem not pure Japanese. Um, that applies to folks of mixed racial backgrounds, but. I had the opposite experience of Laura and the, when I moved out to San Francisco from Boston, New York, I felt, finally felt um, more at home. And it wasn't because there were so many Japanese people. It's just because um, everyone in America sort of piles together Asian American, as opposed to differentiating between Japanese American or Chinese American or Korean American to non-Asians, you're just an Asian American. So we are lumped together with a lot of other cultures, many of which may be different from ours. And then even East Asian versus Southeast Asian, or, um, you know, the Asian continent includes India and Pakistan and other countries. So when you say Asian American, one may have a very generic thing in your head but uh, Asian Americans are very different and diverse themselves. So when I say I felt at home, I felt that you know people who at least look a little bit like me are a dime a dozen on the street. So you're not AB normal, you're not abnormal in any way because 33% of the population here in San Francisco is 
Asian American, mostly Chinese American, but it almost doesn't matter to the Caucasian because they can't tell the difference anyway, usually. Even, you know, our names give it away if you know anything. But, um, but in any event, I felt like now I'm not so abnormal. Now I don't stand out as opposed to being one of, of you know, maybe two or three students in my high school who were Asian. Mm -hmm. Right, great, thank you. Um, so best is not to use Asian American, it's a little bit too broad. Well, it just is a, is a big, not a wastebasket term, but is a very uh, encompassing term, mm -hmm. encompassing term. And so when you say, well, Asian Americans are this or that, um, yes. it's a generalization that doesn't really apply sometimes. Yeah. Um, there, there are some commonalities in the Asian cultures, but there's also big differences too. Yeah, excellent point. So that kind of brings us to the next question. Do you believe that all Japanese people have commonly shared values with which you are raised? So um, maybe Juntaro, you can speak to in, in Japan and then it will be interesting to see if Dr. Rossi and Laura, if you kind of feel like that that's still held commonly within Japanese families who are now Japanese American. Okay. Um, since since I was raised in the U.S., my, my parents are, of course, Japanese, um, and um, I, I could I should say that I'm I'm not like purely Japanese raised, and um, so I I don't feel that I'm unique myself in in the Japanese society, but some some Japanese point out that I have this American style of thinking. I don't I don't recognize it myself, but some people point that out, and so I may be different from a regular Japanese person who who's lived their life in Japan. But, um, but regarding that, um, well. We what we do, what we have is we have when we when we start eating before we eat, we say itadakimas, which is um, expressing gratefulness toward our food, and um, meaning that we will consume our consume and take away the lives of the animals or plants which are our food, and also gratitude towards the people. Who prepared and cook, cooked it? So after eating, also we also say "gochusamadeshita," which again express gratitude towards our food. So, um, what what is behind that um, is that we love nature, we worship our ancestors, and we respect nature. And at the same time, um, we fear nature because we have a lot of typhoons, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes, and we have to learn, we've learned to live with it. So um, we love nature and at the same time we fear nature that I think that is in our basic um, everyday lives. My mother would always threaten us to send us to Kaminari-san when we were bad behaving, which is, you know, yes. the, the God that makes thunder. And, um, you know, the other thing is that, yes, Japanese people are known to, for their etiquette, for their rituals. Every, we still say gochiso sama at the, at the end of every meal and itanagimasu when we're sitting down. Um, there's a lot of etiquette in Japanese culture. There's a certain politeness. Um, you want to be sort of deferential. And uh, even the language demonstrates that because there's different levels of how you say things, depending on whether someone's older than you or more experienced than you, or, or you're equal or someone that's um, younger than you or a child. So every single expression has a different suffix or a way of saying it. And so the language accounts for that, that recognition of your stature compared to someone else. Even how deeply you bow um, is dependent on what you think of the other person or how much respect that person 
um, is uh, allotted and deserves. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of respect for elders. Um, but I have to say that Japanese people are not so homogeneous as one may think. Um, there's a lot of respect for nature, but there's also, they adopt different cultures for different purposes. Someone else says, um, in Japan, you're born Shinto, you get married Christian and you die Buddhist. Um, and uh, there's a lot uh, to say for that. But um, I grew up in a, what I would say, a, a traditional Japanese family. My dad worked, my mom stayed at home and ma managed the finances and was the boss of all the money. But it wasn't that simple. My mom was a surgeon. And um, so when my dad went to the United States for the first time to redo his, part of his training, my mom would be the practicing ophthalmic surgeon would drop us off at daycare. And she would send half her paycheck over to the United States so he could afford not to stay in a YMCA with 50 bucks, which is where he stayed for the first month mm -hmm. he was here. And my mom at the time was um, one female out of a hundred students in her medical school class. So uh, it was very unusual. And she was an unusually vocal Japanese woman. She was not the demure, deferential. In fact, we would, the Japanese word for her, it would be gehin. She uh, swore all the time in Japanese. Um, she, she called us uh, all sorts of names, you know, um, my nickname was Baka or Bakamon, like every other word was that. Uh, so uh, yeah, she was an interesting character and I took a lot of stuff from her. But in any event, um, yeah, so there are certain characteristics about Japanese and Japanese pe people that are in general true and they don't like to have overt conflict. So if you're talking to someone um, who's especially traditionally Japanese, they may, like when you're a physician, you're trying to explain something, they may nod their head in understanding. You just have to probe to make sure they actually are understanding things because often they'll just sort of nod their head yes to be in agreement, but they may or may not be understanding every single word that you're saying. So you have to sort of, I think, um, be aware of that and be aware of that sort of characteristic. So, um, so is it impolite to to disagree with people in, in the Japanese culture? Is it more polite just to agree, uh, kind of to, like you said, nod your head, and then that might not necessarily mean that they're understanding or agreeing? Right, when you're a physician, you, you, your title is sensei, which actually means teacher. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they call you. And um, it, it means that you are the expert and it's not that they don't have questions, but they may not be uh, that open to asking questions in their head if they think that that is impolite or challenging. So I think it's gonna. Be, I think it's important to make sure that it's okay, not only okay, but really necessary for them to understand everything and to ask questions. You might have to draw that out more than someone from another culture. Hmm. Interesting. It's good to know. Laura, is any of what Juntaro and Dr. Rossi saying, is any of that resonating for you and your family? Are there certain values? Because one thing that interests me too is because I imagine that sometimes generationally you might preserve, families might preserve certain cultural expectations that actually might no longer be applying in the original country. You know, I know in Brazil, for example, a lot of German people immigrated to Brazil many years ago, decades ago, and they have practices that people in Germany don't really do anymore, you know. So is that, is that something that you think might be happening or are there certain cultural practices that you feel or values that your family has re tried to retain from their heritage? Um, so my dad's aunt, my great aunt, um, probably incorporated the most um, Japanese sort of in her day to day. And so whenever I was at her house, we said, itadakimasu and gochisa sama um, And she would say things like, she would tell me not to fuss. She would say, don't sawagi, or, you know, she'd kind of scold me and tell me not to fuss uh, when I was little. Um, but that, that aside, I feel like respect and etiquette were things that were just part of my upbringing, but I didn't necessarily recognize that as being unique to Japanese. I just thought that's, that's how you should behave as a person. Mm -hmm. Great. And Dr. Hiroshi, so you, 
you mentioned that your mom was one of a hundred students, but the only female at medical school is, um, I think in a conversation we had before, you said that she outsmarted the, the class and that that was kind of not something that was really considered appropriate at the time. That was definitely not polite for her to outperform the men in the, in the class. That was a, a no-no. Um, in the past, it's been a relatively um, biased against women in general. And I think Japan, in a way, is a little, has been a little bit behind uh, some of the Western cultures in terms of recognizing the equality of women and men. Um, and that's, again, a very big generalization. It may not be true across the board, but I would say, in general, uh, it's probably applicable. Um, so in, in many ways, um, the younger generations sort of emulate things like American things, and they're very trendy. They love to be fashionable um, at the same time and keep up with new trends. At the same time, the older generation love to uh, consider tradition and uh, keep all the cultural things alive and well. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a, not a conflict, but a dichotomy a little bit of really respecting traditional values and rituals at the same time, the younger folks always want to be on the cutting edge of everything. Mm -hmm. And so there's both elements, I think, in Japan. Yeah. If you look in, you know, Shibuya or anywhere, Shinjuku, there's like, you know, people are very fashionably dressed uh, and they really care about appearance and, um, and the fashion labels and things like that and uh, are up on the latest technology. Um, at the same time, uh, you still aren't supposed to eat when you're walking, um, walking outside. That's uh, considered relatively impolite. At least it was when I went to Japan. I don't know if that's still true, Jindo. I mean, you're in the, what they call the kitchen of Japan in, in Osaka. If uh, That's like the best place to eat in the country, probably. But, yeah. Um, yes, um, Dr. Hirose has, has a good point. At, um, the older people have tradition, but um, even the younger people have that tradition in in their everyday lives. But they don't they don't really acknowledge it, and um, they they go for the newest fashion and technology. So um, and it's it's very diverse between the older people and the younger people. But actually, because we are becoming the older people, it's it's changing. Yes, I'm I'm going to be 50 years old um, next month, so um, we're we're probably in um, a generation change shifting currently. Mm -hmm. So you finding um, the younger generation that is aging now uh, is there more of a likelihood of trying to preserve some of the traditions of the parents or are you f feeling like you're migrating more of the maybe Western cultural type of practices that the younger generation is adopting? And do you feel like some of the traditional values are kind of subsiding a little bit? Actually, um, when, when yourself, when you age yourself, you feel that you, recognize the traditional values and embrace it more so um, when when you're younger you don't you don't really recognize those traditions but um, when you get older you you get you um, recognize the traditional values and I think um, so we hold on to the traditional values at the same time but um, get getting new technology and getting and um, learning new things so it's I think it's both Mm -hmm. Do you um, still see in Japan what Dr. Hiroshi was describing in terms of the position of women um, and expectation of women in relation to men? Actually, what, what I see in the news is that um, there aren't the, the numbers of um, the female workers in, in the um, corporate in corporations are 
are fairly high, but um, they're not in a high position. Okay. And um, regard, but regarding university um, graduates, I think it was like forty percent are are female graduates. So it's it's getting higher, but mm -hmm. it's not equal currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're probably on our way, working our way. Yes. Yeah. All right. Great. So in a uh, Japanese family, is there typical, typically somebody who is the decision maker? That's kind of like they expected, this is the person you look to, to make the decisions for their family. Or is that family dependent? Well, um, I think in, in my experience, um, the, the key person, like if, if there is a spouse who is the key person or the next of kin who makes decision making, um, that we ask the next of kin, the spouse, but actually the bloodline, the, the persons, for example, maybe the parents of the person, even if they're married, would be another key person that we'd, mm -hmm. we'd have to reach out to make decisions, especially in critical con conditions, like in, in the hospital settings, mm -hmm. like in organ donation. Yes, we would. Um, so actually it would be a decision making of an older person who would, would have the final call, the last call for that. So if you had a, a married couple it may not necessarily be the spouse if there are parents still, a, or grandparents as well, or just the parents. Well, um, in, in an organ donation setting in Japan, we would um, ask the spouse as the key person, but we would have to, we would confirm that the um, parents or the grandparents are included in the decision making. Mm -hmm. So, um, at least they they know they acknowledge about organ donation and what is going on and and mm -hmm. how they feel about that decision. Yeah. So we have to ask. We would we would ask a, an extended family um, if they all were familiar with organ donation and um, they're comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's non donation related, non hospital related day-to-day -day kind of decision-making when bigger decisions have to be made in the family, who is typically kind of the person who takes the lead in the family? Um, if, it's, if it's like a daily decision-making, that would be the individual. But um, I think, um, well, it's not, I, it's not really, if it's not really crucial, it um, would be the individual. It's interesting. Maybe my model is about 30 or 40 years old. Mm -hmm. But the model I saw, which was repeated in other settings is, and this is very typical. And again, this is dated. This is mm -hmm. as of the 1970s or so. But the father would work and bring the entire paycheck and the mother would be the financial uh, keeper of the house. In other mm -hmm. words, I know that my mom made every decision when it came to mundane things about the house, whether to buy a new refrigerator or to change the rug or to do this or to that. Mm -hmm. My dad had zero to do with that. And my mom made all those decisions. I know that for a fact. Yeah. So that may or may not be still what goes on, but that was pretty typical of that age that the mom had the financial control. She was the CFO <laughs> for sure in my household. I don't know if that's typical still, but. What about par parenting um, decisions? Well, my mom raised us. My dad uh, went to work, mm -hmm. left before we woke up, usually came home after we went to sleep. And, you know, he would be a, the breadwinner. And um, even though he would freely admit that my mom would, had better hands as a surgeon, but when we <laughs> moved um, to the United States, that was a, sort of stereotypical roles that they played. My mom always wanted to go back to practice. She unfortunately died when she was very young, when we were all very young, but she wanted to go back to work. Mm -hmm. But uh, when she was in the United States, she didn't practice medicine. And 
just raised us and uh, she ruled the roost at home though. There's no question who was boss at home. <laughs> Whatever the external experience, the, uh, uh, appearance may look like. So Laura, would you, um, do you relate to that or was that a little different in your family? Uh, I think my experience there was probably pretty American. Both of my parents worked. I think they made decisions pretty equally. Um, I think my mom, just by personality, was a little bit more of a, an introverted kind of demure person. So she may have deferred to my dad. But um, mm -hmm. for the most part, it was a pretty equal partnership as, as far as I was aware. Great. Awesome. So um, are there times and in what ways do you think someone might misunderstand a Japanese person? I think uh, sometimes you mistake quiet for aloof or uninterested. You may mistake, um, you know, being reserved as being sort of mysterious or inscrutable. Um, you may mistake um, politeness for being passive or not having strong opinions. I think those are may maybe errors that one may make because on the surface from another cultural perspective, um, you may not see an aggressive person, but that doesn't mean they're not aggressive inside. Mm. So what you just all, you described Dr. Rossi, would you say overall, what is typical um, to see in kind of the body language of a Japanese person is more of a reserved, holding back quietness, but then there's something else going on internally, potentially. I think at least potentially from initial contact, yes, mm -hmm. until one gets familiar with the setting in which you're in and who the players are, because I don't think most Japanese people want to jump into things and just be the first one to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's why I'm more American than Japanese. <laughs> I would say even with my dad, I did karate for several years growing up and my dad was one of my sensei, was one of my teachers. And it was usually from other people that I heard that he was proud of me. I didn't hear that from him. Oh, okay. so even him being I my I think that's typical of Japanese dads in general. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard a really big compliment from him. I don't think any of us have. Yeah. So, uh, and is that primarily from dad or mom as well is, is complimenting just not over overall not common or just more of it from dad? I'm not sure. I think my mom was a very unusual mom. <laughs> what, how about you, Juntaro, in Japan? What, what do you see? Well, yeah, um, I agree. I, my my father would not compliment me, and um, usually would would scold me, but not compliment. And my mother wasn't really really complimenting, but um, well, she would compliment once in a while more than my father, but still holding back. So so the Japanese will um, they they tend not to express their feelings openly. And, um, but that, that, just as Dr. Hirose said, that does not mean that they are not concerned or interested. Mm -hmm. So um, my impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, um, is it, it, at least from the outside perspective, I've never been to Japan, but the things that I see in the news or the stories I hear, it feels to me like there's a strive for perfectionism, for being really, really good. Um, in fact, I remember going to school with a few boys. I was at boarding school. I went to school with a few boys who went to kindergarten in Japan. And the stuff that they learned in kindergarten was just insane. It was crazy. It was, I mean, it was amazing, but it was strict and it was many hours and it was, uh, I mean, it kind of blew all of our minds. And so it, it feels like there's this uh, mindset of doing very well, you know, striving for excellence. Um, so do you feel, do you feel that's an accurate observation or um, what are your thoughts about that? That's accurate. I think there is a lot of pressure, even on school children and 
people in uh, taking high, high school and college entrance exams, there's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. To the point where you hear some sad stories about suicide. Yeah, I remember hearing that when I was so, young. There is a lot of pressure. When I first came to the United States, my mom had no clue. She didn't speak English. I didn't speak English. She bought a bunch of books for me to mm -hmm. finish before I went to school. And she said, well, this is what a typical kid in Japan would be learning at your age. So you got to finish this book. Mm -hmm. I finished it. I went to class. And uh, for the first time, I went to math class. And in like the first and second grade, I wanted to, well, I had finished learning all my multiplication tables and doing long division at home. And then I showed up to class and they were trying to add. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what is, where, am I, where am I, you know? Yeah. And they comp completely sh shunted me off to the fourth and fifth grade <laughs> because that was the only place where I wouldn't be bored and, you know, be a disruption to the class. So yeah, standards yeah. are different in Japan, uh, particularly for math and other things. But in essence, you're right. People um, want their children to excel. And I think that gets back to why the parents may not praise you very much, because they feel like if they yeah. do, you might feel like you're actually any good. You don't want to feel good or satisfied. You want to continue to excel. So why tell your kids they're, they're doing good? And mm -hmm. the other thing you should never do if you're Japanese is praise yourself. That's a big no-no too. So you have to be humble. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's what uh, the kids these days call it humble brag, you can't be bragging. <laughs> you, can't, you, know, uh, you know, your humility is like, oh my God, I got 98% on the test. I don't know why I messed that one up, you know. <laughs> um, that's a typical response of the parent. You say, oh, I got 98% it's like well what happened to the other two percent you know a little slap on the back of the head <laughs> like, yeah what happened there you know um, yeah. so that's i don't know if that's typically japanese or typically asian i don't know yeah i i mean i grew up in indonesia i wouldn't say that that's the case over there um so but it's it does seem to me at least from the different Asian uh, people I grew up around, it does seem more strongly evident in, in Japanese people. Um, do, and, and I was kind of wondering if that not praising related to that, um, you know, strive for excellence and, and excelling. Laura, did you feel that in your family, um, being that you're a few generations in, or was that toned down a little bit? I, I no, I don't, my parents were not very hard on me, um, but I think I, I just had an internal drive to do well. And I'm, I've always been very hard on myself in the things that I do because I want to be excellent. I want to do a good job at things. Um, Christy Yamaguchi was one of my role models growing up. She's a gold medalist ice skater and she was perfect to me. I never saw her make a mistake and that was something that I just strived to be. Um, but I didn't, I didn't have that sort of external pressure from my parents in the same way that some of my friends did. Sounds like it might be genetic. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now, Dr. Rossi, you mentioned suicides. I remember hearing about that when I went to school in Singapore, um, about some from our Japanese friends about very high suicide rates in, in Japan. Is that still in, in, young, in the younger generation? Is that still the case, Juntaro? Yes, unfortunately, um, there is a high suicide rate in younger people and actually in, in um, older people who are pressured at working. Um, they, there are, the suicide rate is high in general. So, um, well, society in whole is, is aimed at perfection. And unfortunately, when, when you drop out from that, uh, there's no place to go so it's it, in a way it that is um a, a national problem issue mm. that's very sad <clears throat> now what is something that you all wish others knew or understood about the japanese people i think it's important for others to understand how much um honor is important in japanese people and um, and to not um, feel humiliated in any way. I think um, in general, they're very proud people. 
Mm-hmm. And um, it's not that they never make a mistake or anything like that. They want to share that in privacy. And uh, But to be publicly shown up is not a very good thing for Japanese people. So mm-hmm. I think uh, you have to be respectful of that, I think. Um, so not the, calling somebody out in public. Yeah, that's not really a, a great thing for a Japanese person to go through. Mm-hmm. Now I had read and um, correct me if, if I'm wrong, Juntaro, that in Japan, typically, if say you didn't do something correctly, your boss wouldn't necessarily exactly tell you what you did wrong. And uh, they're more likely to praise and acknowledge you, but the fact that you were called into your boss's office and kind of singled out means that something isn't quite right. Is that, is that accurate? I, I read that, so I don't know if that's correct or not. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I, think, I think that there are, there are things, there are times like that. They, mm-hmm. The boss may call you out and um, ask if you have done anything wrong or do you acknowledge anything that you've done, but the boss thinks that you are not, um, you, you've done something that you should have not done. But, um, but well, in, in, in the business setting, um, I think that that doesn't um, distribute the message correctly. So um, more and more in, in the Japanese business setting, the bosses are trained to actually um, talk directly okay. about the situation, yes. Mm-hmm. I think it's I think it's changing though. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you bring up a point of direct communication versus indirect. So traditionally, it would be a lot more indirect, and now you're seeing that in business, it's changing a little bit. Okay, that's good to know. Um, how else could you accidentally, maybe potentially, especially with Western culture or American culture, how could Americans potentially? Um, humiliate a Japanese person, maybe unintendedly. You know, you, you talked about Dr. Rossi not calling somebody out um, in front of other people. What other kind of things could we maybe do unintentionally? I don't know about humiliate, but there are some customs that mm-hmm. you should probably know. Mm-hmm. But I would just say, um, just remember that people are extremely polite, almost to a fault sometimes. Um, and uh, they, in general, are deferential. So um, I would try not to get frustrated with that sometimes if mm. people aren't being very direct. That's just sometimes the way it is. Um, but I do think uh, that's some of the things that I like about the culture because um, if you're too frank, too blunt, too open, too honest, it's not, it's not about honest. You can be honest, but it gets to the point where you're downright rude to your fellow uh, citizen or fellow neighbor. And mm-hmm. if you take it to that extreme, it just becomes an unpleasant society to be in. So mm-hmm. I think there's something to be learned from both sides. Uh, you know, open communication, I think, is always a good thing if it avoids miscommunication. And um, you know, uh, if you don't get the subtle signals, then maybe you've missed the entire uh, a point. But on the other hand, I do think that, um, you know, again, I would not mistake this sort of reserve thing for a disinterest. That's mm-hmm. not, that's not necessarily what's going on. Yeah. Are there certain health or health care beliefs that are commonly shared among Japanese people? Well, I wanted to ask Juntaro, you know, in the Shinto people have traditionally shied away from organ donation because the wholeness of the body and death. And um, I hope that's changing a little bit because that's was often cited in the past by individuals who are approached for organ donation, that there's some um, real importance in keeping the body whole and somehow organ donation doesn't do that after death. So I'm hoping that those beliefs are now either not being held or being refuted or somehow uh, making it understood that renewal of the body and organ donation is a, a wonderful thing, not a bad thing. I know it's an uphill battle. Yes, um, 
just as Dr. Hirose said, um, most as most Japanese are Buddhist or Shin, Shintoist, and we usually hold an open casket funeral, and after that we cremate the body. But um, alteration of the body is is thought of not as approved, so it's an obstacle for organ donation. But um, what we do, what we do in organ donation, we emphasize that the body will not be disfigured um, where it can be seen. And we will take, we will always handle the body with care. So um, it's changing and more people are willing to um, donate and help others. So yes, um, these, this, these 10, maybe 20 years has been a big change in um, organ donation in Japan. Mm -hmm. Does the, um, Dr. Hiroshi, you earlier on mentioned um, honor being something that's very important to the Japanese people. Juntaro, in conversations about organized tissue donation with a Japanese family, um, you were talking about, you know, making sure that they understand that there's no disfigurement of the body. Do, is honor part of that conversation as well? Does that help? to kind of talk about donation in terms of it being something honorable and does that resonate? Um, yes, we, we always talk to, to the family that we honor the body as uh, a human being and um, as the organ, as, as a form of life, not, not like a substance. So, um, we honor the organ as life and pass it on to the recipient as as life. So, we when when we carry the organ on like a commercial flight or even on the bullet train, the Shinkansen, um, we we get a seat for the organ and carry it on on the seat, not not place it on the ground or um, or anywhere that is not appropriate for a person to be. So we honor the organ, we honor the body in, in organ donation. That's beautiful. So you treat the organ as if it, it's a person, really. Yes. That's amazing. I love that. That's very cool. How about uh, in general, in terms of health and health care, are there certain expectations of Japanese people? I, are they pretty open to Western kind of medicine or the cultural practices and expectations? Well, in, um, in, in what we see in Japan, um, the, the Western medicine, we have, we have the, um, the newest technology and um, medicine, but um, so what what the Japanese would expect in Japanese medicine is that healthcare is is virtually low cost and high in 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 quality, mm -hmm. and um, so universal healthcare is 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 implemented in Japan. So um, yes, mm -hmm. the the cost of medicine is fairly low and. That would be that would be an expectation of Japanese. So, um, so no worries about paying for mm. healthcare. Right. It seems that Japanese healthcare may be a victim of its own success. They're very successful, and so there are many greater than hundred years old people living in Japan. Um, when you budget for certain lifespan in the federal uh, budget you don't necessarily budget on 30,000 people being above the age of 100. So sometimes that uh, strains the, I think the financial coffers of the government that supplies all the healthcare. Having said that though, I still think there's a fair amount of um, respect for elders that are part of the culture, the Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I do think that the older folks are very well respected and venerated and, um, in general, I think. Um, so uh, it's, you know, I think uh, US could learn something from Japan. Mm -hmm. 
Is there an expectation of family members uh, when it comes to the person who is sick? Well, um, I think, well, the, when, when there's a patient, when there's a person sick in the family, the family is expected to take care of the patient with the family, with the, um, with the hospital staff. So um, they, would, they would devote their time and, um, and they would devote their time and, and money to take care of the person, mm -hmm. yes. In traditional uh, Japan, uh, you've noticed that both um, of us have uh, Taro as our suffix for the first name. Yes. That means we're both the eldest son. And the uh, eldest son is actually supposed to take care, you know, go after the parents. So mm -hmm. I think I've um, probably not fulfilled my obligations very well as the first son in the family. But anyway, uh, the first son is often expected to do certain things that are, they're also given certain privileges too, of course, but there are also uh, some expectations of the Taro or the first son in the family. Do you, um, does the family typically bring food to the hospital for their loved one and stay and help with physical care? Do they typically sleep at the hospital or is that not, not as common in Japan? Well, um, they, the, the food is provided by the hospital, but um, the, the quality of the food provided by the hospital isn't, isn't really that good. So, um, so the family, often takes brings food um mm -hmm. but um the family often sleeps in the hospital with a with the patient mm -hmm. um when necessary they stay in the waiting rooms even if they know they they don't they can't do anything for mm -hmm. the patient they want to be near the patient so um yes it it the, the family is very dedicated when they're when there's a sick person in, mm -hmm. in the house the family yeah but it, it there is an assumption that the um, the female person in the family would take care of of the patient more but um, well maybe because it, it's because of the time devotion that they could they could spend on that but um, mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's changing it, as, as, um, as younger people, like um, the, the male in, in the family would also um, take their time, spend time more with the patient. Mm -hmm. Great. What about um, are the commonly held beliefs about death among Japanese people? Um, I'm assuming that's probably a little bit religion dependent. Um, and then is there anything that provides meaning in death? We talked about honor and life a little bit, but is there anything you'd like to expand upon with that? Okay, in, in let's say in a hospital setting, setting they would, um, I think the family would stay with the patient more and, um, and even, even if like the, the patient is in the ICU and mm -hmm. They can they can only have um, time with the patient for like 15 minutes a day that it, when it's regulated. Um, the even in that situation, the family would stay in the waiting room and and um, wait for updates of about the patient. Mm -hmm. And they would actually sleep in a waiting room, like like on a bench. Mm -hmm to to be by the patient and um that that is it's very devoting but um they're they're honoring the patient the the body and um and the, actually the healthcare workers are expecting the family to be at the hospital at all times so um it's very tiring for the family at the same time, mm -hmm. and that could be really exhausting, but um, that's that's expected in both ways. So you're talking about while a brain dead patient is being maintained by a mechanical ventilator, that the family oh, would in, uh, yes, and that, that would be in that would be true in a, a brain dead patient, but also um, mm -hmm. 
that would be true in like a, a general surgery patient. Mm -hmm. So the, the family would stay in near, nearby the OR or the ICU until the patient recovers. Now, I know, Juntaro, you and I in the past have talked about this before, but that this may have changed since then, um, because the last time we spoke about this, the um, Japan did not have brain death laws yet, where a patient could be declared brain dead unless a family requested it. Um, and so that has since changed, correct? Actually, um, the, the, the organ donation law has changed, was changed in 2010, 2010. Um, mm -hmm. But um, brain death can be performed only, the brain death declaration can only be performed when the, the patient is going to donate the organs, when the family has consented to organ donation. So brain death is not death in general, excluding um, when, when there is not a donor. But so, um, organ donation, we, it's very awkward, but we have to talk about organ donation first um, mm -hmm. before declaring the patient dead, brain dead. Um, and when the family consents to organ donation, the brain death declaration comes after the consent. Oh, that so must it's, be a bit it's coupled together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you navigate that conversation? I mean, um, how, how does the, is the family receptive to the fact that their loved one is actually dead, even though they're not, they haven't been declared yet? Um, that's, that's very controversial because um, when, when the physician, the attending physician um, talks with the family that there is the it's a it's a grave situation. Mm -hmm. um, they cannot say that the patient is brain dead, but um, the 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 physician says that they are nearly brain dead. They are almost brain dead, but mm -hmm. um, in order to confirm it, there there there's no way to confirm it unless you want to make the decision to donate the organs. So um, wow. I know that in in the U.S. setting. Um, the physician isn't supposed to bring, bring organ donation in the conversation, but in, in the Japanese setting, the, um, the physician is the person who brings up organ donation and asks, requests the family if they are interested in um, talking with the coordinator or not. Mm -hmm. So that it, that is a um, major obstacle that we have to overcome in the Japanese setting. Yeah, that, that does sound challenging. Now, I know um, one of the questions I had asked you at the time is if a family is not um, accepting of brain death and does not want to go that direction, I think my question to you previously was, do you think that they would be more understanding of donation after circulatory death? Yes, um, donation after circulatory death would be an option, um, but in in the Japanese setting, again, um, it's it's very limited to take them off the ventilator. So um, we'd have to wait until literally the heart stops with the patient ventilated mm. and that, that would be like um that would take days weeks sometimes mm. and um of course when when the blood pressure goes down um the creatinine would go up and um the organs would not be able to be um, recovered in a ideal time frame so um, it's very difficult for um, brain dead, brain dead um, donors, brain dead donors, not not brain dead donors, um, the, the um, circulatory death donors. So you don't remove the ventilator from any patient in, in a regular setting? I mean, is a decision ever made by a Japanese family where the family says, we no longer want to continue treatment, please take them off the ventilator and let them go? Does that 
Does that happen in Japan? Um, it, it happens rarely, not, not very much. Even so, if the family um, wants, wants to take the patient off the ventilator, the, the hospital is very um, resistant to that. Um, they, they do not. Well, in, in the past, um, many, um, some physicians were um, sued because mm -hmm. they, they were, the, uh, the family thought, or maybe um, a third party thought that they, they the physicians um, killed the patient by taking them off the ventilator. Mm. So it's common to see a patient remain on a ventilator until the heart has stopped beating, not to remove the ventilator. Yes, it, is, it is common, unfortunately. I see, okay. So in the, um, you said the most common belief um, in, in Japan, the most common religion is uh, Shinto Buddhism, you said? Shinto and Buddhism, yes. Shinto and Buddhism. And um, is brain death something that's typically accepted or not, not as much? Actually, by the, um, just by the lay people. Well, actually, religion doesn't, doesn't really um, say that they accept or do not accept um, mm -hmm. brain death. So um, they're, they're, well, traditionally, disfigurement of the body is not thought of as a good thing in, in mm -hmm. Buddhism and Shintoism. So, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's good to know. Um, so it sounds like if we, um, if we have a Japanese family here in the U.S., and um, if they were, um, the, the bigger concern would be more of the disfigurement of the body and the, the honor in the death than the actual declaration of brain death. Am I understanding that correctly? I think yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, now, are there certain principles I should be aware of when I interact with somebody from Japan? Now, Dr. Rossi, you talked about if I go as a tourist to Japan, but what about if somebody from Japan or somebody who identifies as a Japanese person here in the US, um, are there certain principles that I should be aware of that would help to demonstrate my respect towards them? Yeah, I think, um... First of all, if they are truly Japanese, to bow to someone that has showing respect. So that's mm -hmm. something that Americans don't usually do, but Japanese people do all the time. They mm -hmm. may not expect someone, uh, someone who's a Caucasian to do that, but it might be an unexpected welcome surprise. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, you have to make sure there's no language barrier because, um, you know, again, Japanese people are not they may nod a lot of the time when they're not really understanding everything that you're saying. So I think you have to somehow determine uh, that the message is getting through um, whatever message you're trying to get across. So that, that would be good to determine after, especially if you're explaining something that's a little bit complicated. Mm -hmm. I think those are important uh, concepts. What's interesting though, is that, you know, if in this specific case of organ donation, you know, the Buddhists actually do end up after, you know, cremating the body, releasing the soul from the body a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, in the end, that's okay uh, to cremate the body because the soul lives on. So in terms of the meaning of death, you know, the spirit of the person lives on. And every year there's a one festival to honor the spirit of your ancestors who's passed away. That's a very important holiday, by the way, in Japan is Obon. And that's to recognize and actually calls the spirits of your ancestors or those who have passed on back to that place. So that's actually the belief of um, many Japanese. And again, it's an extraordinarily important holiday. Um, so that's part of their belief system too. I do think that um, uh, maybe being a little less forward um, on the initial approach and being a little less uh, 
I, I don't say I think conf confrontational, but being sort of a little bit reserved in the first place may get you further in the long run than um, meeting something head on and uh, just being open and blunt the very first interaction. So again, that's just general principles. I don't think that every single Japanese person will react that way. But I think so don't come on too strong? Yeah, not at the beginning, I think. <laughs> I think that's in general true. Now, there are many Japanese people that totally violate that rule and are come on strong and are very gregarious and really um, uh, are quite engaging from the get-go. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, stereotype um, and generalize across the entire nation of Japanese people. But I, I would think that if you saw that kind of behavior, um, don't be too surprised. That's good to know. Um, Juntaro, do you have any other suggestions as well? Um, yes. Um, I, would, I would like to point out that maybe um, bowing to a Japanese when, when you when you honor them and you have respect and you bow, that would be okay. But when you're like superficially bowing to a Japanese, that might be in some way insulting or maybe mm -hmm. making fun of them. Mm -hmm. So um, I think respect and honor is a key word. Mm -hmm. And what's in the heart, right? Where it's coming from. Yeah, I think yes. that's probably more important, the honor and the respect. Yeah. Um, Laura, have you, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Um, I, I'm not sure if this is a Japanese thing or if it's just more of a personal thing, but I also think kind of going along with what um, both Jintaro and Dr. Hirose have said, um, especially in the beginning when you're meeting people is to not be too forward with your body language either or to perceive um, a Japanese or a Japanese Americans person um, uh, greeting in response if they're not very forward with their body language to not take that as a sign of being disinterested or stoic I think mm -hmm. um, respect for people's personal space is important. Mm. What about eye contact? Does that have any place? There's a word in Japanese uh, that's hard to translate sometimes. It's kazukashi, mm -hmm. and it means um, almost shy, I guess, or something like that, but it's not. It's, you don't want, um, eye contact is fine, but I don't think you need to stare or do, uh, you know, um, Again, people are a little bit reserved on first glance, so uh, you're you're not out there trying to be everything from the first moment. Um, I I don't know how to explain that, but um, it's sort of you're supposed to not be like over gregarious from the moment uh, you say hello. Mm -hmm. So don't be too bubbly. Well, you can be bubbly. I just wouldn't go all out. I don't know. <laughs> Hold back on the bubbles. <laughs> I think it's okay. I just don't want to, you know, make it seem like, you know, they're uh, a, a sort of aloof population. They're not. They're very warm to their loved ones, to their friends, to everybody. It's just... Um... Just let them warm up to you. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is there a question you wish I had asked that I didn't ask before I get to my final question? So what do you love most <laughs> for each one of you? What do you love most about um, the Japanese culture and in, in the way you interpret it and your experience of it? So I'll start with Laura. Gosh. Um, I, I like that it's very, it's very dichotomous. It's, a, it's very steeped in tradition, but it's also very interested in being cutting edge. I grew up participating in a lot of cultural sort of activities that tied me to my Japanese roots and made me appreciate sort of the traditions of the Japanese culture. Um, but I also very much appreciate technology and excellence and, and new and 
innovation. Um, so. Great, thank you. How about you, Dr. Rossi? Well, what I love most, um, obviously you can look at me and know that I like to eat food, but um, what I love about uh, Japanese culture is the love of nature and the uh, appreciation of the aesthetic, whether it's flower arrangement or sushi making or Japanese cuisine in general. It's just as important as how it looks as how it tastes. Mm -hmm. So people are very concerned about how, um, you know, the beauty of things. And I love that about, you know, you don't just slop, uh, slop a cheeseburger on your plate and just that's it. It has to be neat. It has to be beautiful. And you eat with your eyes first. So that's true of everything you look at in Japan, whether it's a, a rock garden or the gardens in Kanazawa or a plate of sushi that you have in a fine restaurant. Everything has to have an appearance. It's sort of orderly. This is the way it's done. And the way it's done is it changes all the time. You know, there's very traditional sushi people. And then there's people who are sort of avant-garde and throw some Peru Peruvian influences in it. But regardless, it has to look, it has to look appealing. It has to be clean. And, you know, things run on time. Uh, Shinkansen is almost never late. Um, but I like the precision of all this stuff because uh, it's very well thought out. There's things that you know, don't know that people are thinking about when they're preparing a plate of sushi. They have to know like how to cook the rice, whether it's polished or not, how you fan it, the perfect amount of vinegar and, and uh, sugar, and then the mouthfeel of the rice as it uh, is on your plate. And I, I know that's a, those seem like silly details, but it makes going to Japan such a pleasure because people are concerned about it and actually people appreciate it. So mm -hmm. that's not always the case everywhere you go. So that's what I love about Japan. Yeah, the arts seem amazing. And like you said, the creativity in everything, because it, it feels, you know, on one hand, you, you have such precision and perfectionism and excellence in development and technology and so many different things that Japan presents. And then on the other side, you also have the arts in all of that and the beauty of um, the presentation. It's, it's quite amazing. How about you, Juntaro? Um, I, I agree with Dr. Hirose. Um, when you get in, when you go to a McDonald's in Japan, the cheeseburger is perfect versus a <laughs> cheeseburger in the U.S. So um, even even a cheeseburger, when like a high school su student is making the cheeseburger, it's perfect. So. Mm. Um, there is perfectionism and it, everything is um, clean because I think we we um, we love nature we love we love each other and um, we care about each other and um, I think that's that's fundamental in in the Japanese yes wonderful well um, thank you all, to all of you for making the time to share um, a little bit about yourself and, and about your common identity as Japanese um, people, but with very different backgrounds. And I think, as we've seen today, you know, depending on how we grew up and our experiences, certain things um, can carry different value to us, or our experiences can be different. So, would you be, would you say it would be okay to ask? Each person, if I met, if I was, say, as a nurse taking care of somebody from Japan, or I met somebody from Japan, do you think it would be okay for me to ask them and say, can you show me and teach me how to honor you, how to respect you, and what's important to you? Do you think that that would be received? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I think so, yes. Excellent. Wonderful. Um, thank you, all of you, so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And arigato. Is that the right word? Thank you. <laughs> no arigato. Thank you. All right. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thank you.